I think to start with, to um, to understand the issue, I think it would be quite a good thing if you could, um, I've got a, a short video where we shorten it for the purpose of the presentation, but just to understand the issue. So if you can put a video on to start with, and then I'll give a presentation. Thanks, Sebastian, for the video. Uh, let's try and see if you can share your screen now for the presentation so that it works all out. Thank you. Thank you very much for the, uh, for the great introduction. So I'm going to share my screen now. All right, it seems to work. Great, excellent. Let's get started. Thank you so much, Sebastian. OK, so what I, what I would like to talk about today is try to, to explain how we want to answer the, the, the massive issue we've just uh, presented on the, uh, on the video early on. And the whole idea is to stop considering e-waste as a waste, but more to put it what it is, which is any source or material. So altogether, we must have seen along the, you know, on, on Google or whatever you look at, that tsunami of e-waste, which everybody keep on quoting, which I think was from somebody from the UN at some stage, which is because Today, annually, we've got a volume of e-waste, which is over 50 million, 52 million tons. And this, in the next decades, is offered to, is proposed to double. So we really need to do something about it, keeping in mind that this is only recycled. 20% 20, 20 of it is only recycled. Now, here is a term that is really, really uh, misleading. Recycle. We're all very familiar to the... Uh, we get, a, we get a cup of coffee and we make sure we put a cup. Oh, it's recyclable. Great. We put it in the orange bin. Everything is done. The problem is that it's also the recycling method, which is an issue in many, many cases, particularly in this case. So the problem we've got with e-waste is that it's not just another plastic. It is something which is not only there's a massive amount of waste, which is a toxic to a lot of people in different places, but also it contains a massive amount of non-renewable resources including gold, silver, copper, uh, critical material, all these material that we're running on empty, we need to do something about it. So altogether, there's two major issues there. The first one is to prevent the toxic waste. And the second one is to use these e-source, not e-waste, to recover essential resources. This is really, really fundamental, recovering them in a sustainable way. So. By leaching, this is what I'm going to talk about today. So what is it? I mean, it's something which, if I seems very new, a lot of people haven't heard about it, but it's been there for, for many decades. So in a few words, the metal extraction from low-grade ores and mineral concentrate using microorganism. This is how it is defined and how it's been used in the mining industry for decades. 
Biodegrading is part of the uh, that group of uh, all methods, including biodegradation. You all do your, or some of you do composting in the garden, or the biostimulation, the biomutation, where we actually try to modify the way microorganisms already work on our waste. And this is all part of that so-called bioremediation. Altogether, when um, when we talk about bioleaching, <clears throat> and what we've done is is actually quite spectacular. A lot of people love it, and they try to think, oh, this is really really brand new. But altogether, it's not really, really new. So the idea is to, to convert some hard metal into soluble metal. So in fact, it's been in the mining industry for 60, 70 years. When you're so great, the group in Coventry has, has invented something. Unfortunately, I wish. Unfortunately, we haven't. It is something which has been used for a while in the mining industry, where they've got tons of rocks, and they want to extract ores and minerals. The key is that they use microorganisms for that. And this has been done for a while, but the key is that it's something which has not been really uh, looked into in the waste management. It's only something quite new. And in waste management, it's been used very much in labs, in different research groups, but it hasn't been brought to industry yet. So what we're trying to do is really to, to scale that up. So the big question is that when people come up and tell me, well, this is really great what you do in a lab, but can you actually scale it up? And scaling up, if you look at scaling up in the mining industry already, this is something which is already existing, so good evidence that we can do it. But let's keep in mind, it's pretty ugly if you look at these pictures, but let's keep in mind that if we work with waste, if we work with electronic waste, we're talking about something which is much more concentrated. In the mining, mining industry, they're going to have a few grams within tons of rocks. But in electronic waste, as you know, if you take a PCB, you've got all your concentrated metal there. So we're talking about scaling up, which is much smaller than this one. So a quick picture to try to illustrate the way it works. And this is quite simple. I mean, I think it's, it looks very Star trek -y. It's very sort of a futuristic or bacteria can actually pick up metal. But it's very simple. In fact, there are a couple of different methods, but all together to illustrate really how it works. I think this is the best one. So in the middle here, you've got your bacterium here, which is right in, a, in, a, in an environment where you've got copper all around. So how does it work? Well, this bacterium is going to need iron to survive. So what, to start with, what you do, you feed your bacterium with ferrous iron, which is here, right here, and this is going to start to be oxidized so your bacterium can survive. Now, once iron is oxidized, oxidized iron, ferric iron itself, is really unhappy remaining oxidized. So it will try to find any other way around to pick up an electron and to oxidize something else so it gets reduced. So if you've got your bacterium fed with iron in the middle of other metal, once iron is being oxidized, ox iron in itself oxidizes the other metal, in this case, copper. Once copper has been oxidized, oxid uh, copper becomes in solution, but at the same time, iron is not back to ferrous iron, which the bacterium is going to oxidize again. So this is a clever bit. You keep on feeding your bacterium with iron, which will be oxidized by the bacteria. The bac in, in due course, iron oxidizes the metal which is surrounding, and then in due course now, it's being oxidized again. So you got this kind of a micro circular economy where somehow just by feeding with iron your bacterium, constantly your certain metal will actually be oxidized. In this case, we're looking at a case which is a bit complicated because we're talking about um, mining iron, so you're going to sulfur, but in electronic waste, it's a bit more simple. So what are the benefits of that? First of all, the first question is that people get to be scared about uh, bacterium. Oh, bacterium tend to be toxic. They think E. coli, they think no, it's actually a toxic thing. So no, in this case, we use um, some bacteria and some uh, methods which are non-toxic. So we actually replace what are toxic methodology in, in the normal uh, procedures in the recycling. We don't produce any, any uh, high, uh, any gas. We don't use any acid, no high temperature. So no need to high pressure temperature. So no strong uh, carbon footprint. Also, growing those bacterium is really inexpensive. You feed the bacterium with some sort of a, some sort of broth, a different kind of a mixture. It's something which is really cheap. The bacteria grow at room temperature or up to 37. So again, very inexpensive. And the key is that now there are more and more and more techniques that are being developed into the um, recycling waste and quality metal from waste and drainage. And again, I think I'm using the term recycling because people are familiar with it, but I think it would be good if we try to think of not recycling, but recovering. And this is what I really want to emphasize at the end of the presentation. 
So how does it work? I mean, I said in the, in the different research groups, some different, um, very few, very different research group have developed some methods. And here's a very good example. So we're starting, the idea is to extract indium from, uh, from monitors, from screen. And put simply, as you can see, the first thing is mechanical. So you dismantle your screen, then they get shredded and would get shredded and grounded. So now we've got it in the powder so that you can literally feed the bacteria with the powder. So that then if those bacteria get fed with iron then all the base metal can actually get oxidized. And you end up having your, what I would call a bacterial soup, which now has the metal in solution. This is great. And most of academic are really proud of that and publish it. The problem is that, as you can see, that picture is a bit lying because there's something missing there, the last arrow. Because the point is that you can have as much as you want of your metal in solution, but for industry, this is not really usable or barely usable. So what we've really been tackling in my group, and which we published with an example with copper, for example, is to make sure that we've got a complete cycle. So what you start with is your PCB, which gets shredded, you grow your bacterium, you incubate your bacterium with your in your broth cultures so that the, the copper is being in solution. And then instead of stopping there, then we would have different methods which are also sustainable to make sure that we can obtain the copper foil back so that the copper can be reused into the PCB. Now the key is that where this method is really much better than most of the method is that thanks to the purity of the copper foil we obtain, the copper is not simply to be used into a PCB but it can be recycled to many other supply chain. So somehow, again, that method I keep on talking about recycling is more than recycling, recovering the copper so that we're opening many other supply chain. So what do we do in the, um, so this is the theory, this is the group, and what have we done to bring that to, uh, to industry? We've, um, over the last uh, three years, we did a knowledge transfer partnership where the key is that, as we know in industry in uh, academia, we've got a lot, of, um, a lot of knowledge, a lot of theory, a lot of practices, but this is really transferred into industry. So we've been very lucky to work with a company called N2S, which is a company which over the last 50 years has been recycling electronic waste, but I've got no idea, well, they had no idea of any biological procedures. So the key was that we applied for a grant with the UK government, that grant was 250,000K, uh, over three years, where the idea was to, first of all, to, in the lab, we start in my lab to make sure that we confirm that those metals from PCBs can be extracted. Then the idea is to transfer the knowledge into the company. So we literally had to build a laboratory in end to -end premises, which was a bit com complicated, as you can expect, since they had no idea of any biological, biological mechanism. And finally then, we, once we've got a, the, the lab into place, we need to develop some method to extract the metal. So this was the, these were the objectives within the, the project plan. Now, for the company point of view, the key was, first of all, they wanted to keep the metal in-house because so far, they would dismantle the computer, the PCBs, and send this abroad to be processed. They would get some money back, having no idea what they've sent and no idea what became to it. So again, they wanted to make sure that the method that were used downstream wouldn't be toxic methods. And finally, what they really wanted to do was to develop a method which is also much more efficient than what is actually used now. So the project went actually fantastically well. To be honest, when you, when you draft such a grant, which is a three years knowledge transfer, you expect that at the end of the three year, the company is gonna be able to, uh, to continue by themselves, but it's just the beginning of it. In fact, in our case, it worked really, really well. The first thing which I was really amazed with is that when I'm discussing with a company, where they were telling me, well, so what kind of method should we do? And as my question was, well, what sort of metal do you have? And then you understand the first key point is there, is that whether it's this recycling company or any manufacturers of computers, they have no idea of the material which is contained into their, into their computers. So we started back and doing some analysis to find that, as you can see, I don't expect you to read all the table, but the composition and the components within those computers, some of them from the 70s, are incredibly rich. So then we, we, went, we went back to the, to the verification stage. So I'm just a quick, uh, quick show, show that to show the, what we did for the first six months. But a bit that's quite interesting is the graph on the right here. 
the most important thing is that on a most simple setup, which is shredding your piece of PCB, mixing with the bacteria, ignore this graph here, but this one here, you can see that on a most simple setting over seven days already without um, optimizing anything, you get already 35% of your copper in solution. And then you also got your zinc, your aluminum, your manganese, and so on. So this was the proof of concept, which was extremely simple and extremely successful. Then, of course, that went on a bit more. And what we ended up doing was that, which we published later on, to really demonstrate that, as I mentioned earlier on, by shredding and by leaching the PCBs, we end up for copper, for example, we get something which is extremely pure, a fold which is extremely um, which is visible for any other application, so that altogether, when we even analyze the, the copper with electron microscope, we find that this is a 99.5% 99 purity. So the good thing is that we're opening doors instead of just having that idea of recycling back to what it was with a bit of a waste on the side, we're not. We're opening many doors. So somehow the power of this recovery is a very, very strong business asset. Altogether, then to get a bit Something a bit more complicated, which is a bit simplified too, is that one of the keys when you try to work with the bacterium, of course, at some stage, the bacteria don't want to work anymore. They've got their tried to tackle the copper, the zinc, the tin, and so on. And that's the got a negative feedback that tend to stop the bugs. So what we develop is what we call indirect bioleaching. So right in the middle here, you've got now your bacteria in a bioreactor making all their oxidant, the leachate. But we separate them from the metal so that there's no negative feedback. So once the leachate is done, we're targeting the metal, the, the PCBs, then the metal get all separated and get recuperated in different methods here through cementation, electro winning, and so on. And then importantly, what else we do is that anything coming out of it is being recycled itself so that we go back to the bacterium and feed them again and start again. So whichever method we use there, again, we got a real closed loop system where there's no nothing lost in the environment that would actually compromise the environment, while at the same time, recovering all the metal we want to recover. So what are we planning to do next? My dream and what I've been working on is that uh, metal uh, bio-recovery roadmap. So let's see where we start. We start with your electronic waste. Then there are some, this is all bioleaching core, but altogether we got some, we introduced other separation methods, which are a bit complicated, but all sustainable to make sure that we target on one hand some of the base metal, the noble metal, the street balls, and all of them would have a specific process of recovery. The important thing is that the processes in itself are designed according to the metal, but not really according to the device. So that in the end, once you're having your purified gold, your cobalt, or your copper, you know that these metal can then be recycled, but not simply into the wheat, but can also be into, into wrapping, into solar panel, into electric batteries, and so forth and so on. So that somehow, again, this part of the recycling is targeting opening of the supply chain, not simply closing down. And this is quite an important point. So what do we do now? The next stage is that for, we continue working with N2S, and now we have to scaling up where in fact somehow from a small SME, then becoming a, a global company with actually all um, scaling up all of what we're doing. But all this method is now be applied also to, to other metal recovery. We want to target also on the side. Within we, you got a lot of plastic. So we're targeting the plastic through bioremediation, targeting textile. So it's really something we I really want to bring it in to illustrate what we can do with metal, but also beyond that. To finish with that, there's a last slide I would like to, uh, to bring up is that before the talk, I was looking for a proper representation of what I would call circular economy. On, the, on Google. And it always makes me laugh because you've got a lot of those pictures where somehow circular economy was circular as you come in and come out. This is not circular to me. This is just a bit bent. It's a linear we bend because we come resource and waste. And this is what the problem is. And the only one I could find which was a bit more elaborate is this one because what you get really close is the recovery and a design get together. This is the key. The problem we have is that when people come with a bat electric batteries or a PCB and tell me, can you recycle this? My point is that if it was designed so that I can recycle it in an easy way, it would be much, much better. So the true key of the circular economy 
is going to be when manufacturers and providers will consider what the recovery method is into the design. And this is the important thing. And somehow I think what I would see as a circular economy is not just a simple circle that start and end. It is one of those uh, endless crew where you've got it's moving on. The design has to be worked with a, money, with a recycler so that we can end up having something which is facilitated and that the recyclers are not the end of the line or the end of the cycle. They're the beginning. I think this is really, really fundamental. I'd like to thank uh, my team at Coventry and I'd like to thank the, um, the N2S team too, which, uh, which has been without whom. We can see this is really important. This knowledge transfer is that I'm not the only, the only research group that got a fantastic method, but the key is that we needed an industry partner to be able to translate all that. Thanks to them, we've been to COP26, we've been everywhere. It's something which is really, really successful thanks to that collaboration with the industry and, uh, and academia. Thank you very much. So hi, Sebastian, I'm back. I'm here to give you some questions. Uh, thanks for still having the time. Tell me a little bit, because you mentioned that it would be great that also the companies that know now what kind of materials they actually use, if they would redesign their ideas and already factor this recovering process into the design so that it would be much easier. Do you already have gotten some notes from some players, global companies that might be changing now that they know what you can actually do? This is a very, very important point because the issue we had at the beginning with N2S when I was asking them, so within those components, within the little chips, what metal do you have? And they didn't, they didn't know. So we need to do some ICP to analyze so forth and so on and then to redesign a method. So when I talked to um, some of the giants of the IT industry and I explained that and they, they, they loved it and they all come and say, fantastic, what can we do to help? I said, well, if, as an example, to make it more simple, if on your chips, for example, on your components, you just, just take a code and tell me what is in there, then that's going to be much, much easier for me to know how to design a process. The answer, unfortunately, was that, well, we can't really do that. A, we don't know what is in there. But even if we come upstream and work with, uh, with the providers, somehow they don't want to do it because there's some, uh, some competition IDs and some IPs protected, which make it a bit more complicated. So it really shows that somehow it will, it, it should be able to be, we should be able to be to, to do that. But somehow we need to work on some, it's not simply the technology. And that's always what the problem is with innovation. We come with a lot of ideas, but then we've got, we've got the IPs, we've got the confidentiality, we've got the legal. There's a lot of other things that we need to tackle to work together. I don't, I don't, I don't think it's impossible, but I think we can see where the obstacles are. So um, give, give me a time frame. When do you think your basically discovery will be used and really make a big difference that you know maybe a global company is really saying this is how everybody should be producing so if everybody is doing it we are also not still you know keeping secrets what kind of metals or what kind of uh, production materials we are using so when do you think this uh, this project will really take off so the pro the project has already taken off because the key is that when i was saying we're not really uh, targeting a device it's not anymore about uh, I've got a company coming and say, here's my PCB, can you buy a leash tab? The key is that because the method I've been designing targeting metal, the company I work with, the N2S, has already got some uh, patent file for some of the metal, which they already commercialized as, um, as selling back, bringing back to market. So somehow, I think the methodology needs to be considered according to the metal for the processes. Now, on the other hand, my dream is that once we got a complete roadmap and each and every piece of uh, electronics and beyond that, will actually be used into a, into a power plant. I mean, my vision is that in uh, maybe, 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 maybe 5, 10, 20 years, each big capital in the world will have a plant where somehow all these devices will actually be recycled as such. But the key is that it's true. On the one hand, it's a long, it's a long road before everything is done altogether. But to this day, there are already some metal that we can actually, uh, we do by each. This company, N2S, is already doing it with quite a few metals. Thank you so much, Sebastian, for taking the time. And of course, if there are more questions coming up, I'm sure we can refer them to you later on. Thank you so much. And Thank you very much. And greetings to Coventry. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs>